Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel on this snowy spring day. It's good to see you. And those of you who are watching by video, we're happy that you're here. This land on which we gather is the traditional land of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. They have lived and thrived here for thousands of years. We give thanks for the land and its people, and we pray that in our worship and in our daily lives, we may honor the traditions and respect that is held for this land. Thank you, Philip. It's good to hear the organ again, and it's good to have you leading our music today. And thank you to Abby, to Jim, Pierre, and Mark for special music this morning. Thank you to Blake, our lay reader, our production team, ushers, and coffee and conversation hosts on Zoom. Tomorrow, as you may know, is Food Bank Monday. So if you didn't bring something with you today, please drive by between 2 and 4 tomorrow afternoon and drop off your donations at the front door. Or you can also uh, make an e-transfer to the envelope secretary to make a donation. This month, the recipient of our food bank uh, Sunday is Russell Heights. Our midweek Lenten services continue this Wednesday by Zoom at 7 p.m. and you will receive a link from the office. There is no faith study this week, but Telios Women's Group will also be meeting by Zoom on Wednesday following the Lenten service. And the topic, I believe, is Emily Carr and Heide Gwai? Yes. The senior choir has started rehearsing again. So exciting on Thursday evenings at 
and new members are welcome. So please think about joining us. We're still wearing masks and sitting, uh, keeping socially distanced in the choir loft, but we are preparing to return to the service on Palm Sunday, and that will be a glorious day. Last Sunday, as you know, the new council was commissioned during the service. And today I wanted to highlight the work of the worship committee. Uh, members of the committee include Shelley Farrell, who is our minute taker and representative to the website team, website committee. Uh, Janet Campbell, who ranges for all the lay readers for every service. Joan Clough, who makes sure we have ushers now that we are meeting in person again. Uh, Jennifer Mogridge, who coordinates communion services, servers. Joan Foster Jones, who takes care of the beautiful banners. Sandra Copeland, who coordinates the decoration of the sanctuary for the changing seasons. Irene Baker, who arrives, arranges for people to serve coffee. Anne Frederking, who is our financial tracker, as well as being the director of the Emanuel's, and Russ Pastic, who represents uh, the audiovisual team. And of course, our dedicated ministry team of Brian Copeland and Teresa Clark bring their pastoral and musical gifts. So as you can see, it takes a lot of people to plan, prepare, and deliver meaningful spiritual worship services. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to this team. Last month, as you may remember, we heard from the anti-racism and equity lead of the United Church of Canada, Adele Halliday. Last Wednesday, at our faith study, a group of us began a discussion on diversity and inclusion and how it plays out at Emmanuel. These discussions will continue in April and we'll be sending out notices from the office so anybody is welcome to join us. They are on, link, on, uh, on Zoom and uh, at 7.30. So today I would like to share with you the first video produced by the United Church of Canada about racism in the church. United Church of Canada has committed to becoming an anti-racist church. What might this mean for all of us in terms of understanding racism in the church? Four United Church leaders share their insights. If you're part of a religious system, and in particular, if you're part of a Christian system, recognizing that our history, the history of how we came to be as a um, church in the modern day was rooted in racism. You have to experience racism or a problem yourself in order to be, uh, you know, to associate yourself with it. I know some of my people have, and that's where I get in, get involved. When I think about racism, I think about kind of different kinds of racism. There's there's individual racism. There there are the the subtle underlying kinds of things. Then there's structural racism, and it could be things like uh, being considered for a, a, a role in a congregation until people realized that the individual was black. Who are uh, in the leadership right now, right? I mean, this is a pastoral charge congregation level, but also regional council and general council, um, still very much uh, white leaders. And so um, do you think that they are the only ones who are capable or is it that certain group of people were not giving a fair or equitable chances to uh, play and serve the church? Most of the time, I would say probably 99% of the time, I'm invited to speak or, or to do something is around um, my race or, or issues of culture. 
And in, in a way, I get that people want to be uh, open, but I also understand that what they've done is that they've, they've pigeonholed me. I'd love the day when um, somebody would invite me to speak on something other than my <laughs> skin color uh, race. And I'd love the day when there are so many of us in in the church. If, if that had been the trend for us to mingle with, with the white way of uh, doing it, uh, we would have lost uh, the way what we've tried to establish to uh, to uh, conduct our our faith and services church services in our way in our language with our culture they seem to have a certain kind of notion of asian woman and 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 often that is very quiet um kind of submissive even kind of exotic um, and uh, certainly I'm none of that. Therefore, you know, you don't look like what we think Asian woman um, supposed to be, right? Or Korean woman supposed to be. Dismantling racism in our church requires us to acknowledge systemic barriers faced by many indigenous and racialized people in the church and acknowledge the ways in which the church has knowingly and unknowingly contributed to racist actions. In the year 2020, the General Council, the highest national decision-making body of the United Church, approved a motion committing the church to become an anti-racist denomination. The motion came from people in congregations. And part of what that motion was really calling us to was not just to do things at the General Council office or, or just with our policies, but to really work on this throughout all of who we are as the United Church of Canada. I've been talking to a lot of people from different, uh, my friends from different parts of the country, is how do you say United Church in your language? Because to us, to me, in uh, in Garden Hill, it's called the Wapska Mehogamuk, which means white church in uh, Southern Ontario, they say the same thing. They re refer their church as a white church. And wouldn't it be exciting if someday we change that, not to call it the white church? Racism has been part of our life and will continue to be part of our life unless we make a difference, unless we make change inside ourselves and inside the structure. I think there's a lot of work for all of us to do together in this. I think there are different ways that we need to be doing this work. We light the Christ candle to symbolize Christ's presence with us here today and always. Maybe. Sorry. There we go. And we light the a firm candle to proclaim to the members of the Rainbow community and their allies that they are truly welcomed and accepted in this place. Welcome to this sacred place of belonging where we embrace the sacredness of life and recognize the dignity of each person, spirit filled with the image of God, the mystery in whom we live and move and have our being. Welcome to all who have no church home, need strength, want to follow Christ, have doubts. Welcome to visitors and to new and old friends. Welcome to grandparents, to mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, youth, couples, and single people. 
Welcome to people of all colors, cultures, abilities, gender identities, and sexual orientations. To old and young, to believers and questioners, and welcome to questioning believers. This day, we are all invited to live into God's love, peace, and justice. The first hymn is uh, Come Touch Our Hearts, More Voices, number 12. Touch our hearts that we may know compassion from failing embers built a blazing fire love strong enough to overturn injustice to seek a world more gracious come touch and bless our hearts come touch our souls that we may know and love you your quiet presence all our fears dispel. Create a space for spirit to grow in us. Let life and beauty fill us. Come touch and bless our souls. Come touch our minds and teach us how to reason. Set free our thoughts to wonder and to dream. Help us to open doors of understanding, to welcome truth and wisdom. Come touch and bless our minds. Come touch us in the moments we are fragile, and in our weakness your great strength reveal, that we may rise to follow and to serve. Steady now our nerve, come touch and bless our wills. Come touch us now, this people who are gathered, to break the bread and share the cup of peace, that we may love you with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, our all. Come touch us with your grace. Please join me in the call to worship, followed by the opening prayer. Blessed and blessing, loving and loved, God's people of Emmanuel, come to this place. We are ready. From times of work, from times of play, from times of busyness, from times away, God's people of Emmanuel, come. To speak and to receive, to sing and to pray, God's people of Emmanuel, come. We're here. We're here. We're here to worship God. Please join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Traveling God, as we leave what is familiar and find ourselves moving through a wilderness land, may we gather as a community of trust. May we set out our holding, calling her call to your longing and to your love, which will bring us through. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One day, Jesus told a story. There was a farmer who had two sons. The two sons helped on the family farm. They fed the sheep and the cows. They cleaned out the stable where the animals lived. They grew vegetables to eat. They worked very hard. But one day, the younger son said, I don't like it here. I don't want to feed sheep and cows. I don't want to clean stables. I don't want to grow vegetables. The son went to the father and said, please give me half of your money. I want to go away. The father felt very sad and did not want the son to go away. But the father gave the money to his son and said goodbye. The son began to walk. Over the hills he went. Around the mountains he went. Through the rivers he went. He saw so many new things. 
This is great, the son said. And he walked some more over the hills, around the mountains, and through the rivers. He met lots and lots of people. How wonderful, the son said. And then the son began to spend the money. And soon all the money was gone. Now the son had nowhere to sleep. He had no food to eat. He had to take a job feeding pigs. The son began to feel very sad. He looked at the pigs. He looked at the pigs' food. He was so hungry. The son began to wonder, will my father let me come home again? The son decided to find out. So the son began to walk. Over the hills he went, around the mountains he went, through the rivers he went. It was a long, long way back home. Over the mountains, across the hills, through the rivers. Finally, he saw his father's house. And there was his father. The son felt afraid. What would father say? But then the son saw his father running so fast, father was running to him. The son called out, father, I don't deserve to be your son. The father gave the son a big hug. My son, beloved child, said the father, I am so glad you are home. Now I have both my sons again. The father gave a big party for the son. All their friends came. They ate and drank. They sang and danced. The father was so happy to see his son again. The scripture readings today are Psalm 32 and Luke 15, 1 to 3, and 11b to 32. Psalm 32. Blessed are those who are forgiven. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whom spirit there is no de- whose spirit there is no deceit. While I keep silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up, and by the heat of summer, then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you, and at a time of distress and rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you and with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with a bit and bridle, else it may not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who I trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything and severe famine took place throughout the country, and he became, began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But then he came 
when he came to himself and said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and filled him with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then get the fatted cat, a, fat, a fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Then they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called out to this, one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he is, has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command and yet you've never given me even a young goat so I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and now he has been found. Hear what the spirit is saying to us in the church. Could I be so misguided, wandering from a loving home? My adventures leave me hollow. I am ready to atone. Fleeting was my friend's excitement. How I long for steadfast care. I'll go back to where I came from. Seek a humble living there. Near to home, my father hails me with a great smile on his face. And relieved from anxious worry, wraps me in a warm embrace. He restores my former status, gives me shoes and robe and seal. Glad to have his children with him, he commands a lavish meal.
Thank you. Thank you to Pierre and Jim and uh, Mark for that beautiful song. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are a child of God. That is the good news of the scripture readings today. Psalm 32, which Blake read, is a mashal psalm, which means a Hebrew song that imparts wisdom. Here, David is talking about the importance of confessing our sins and how the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the ones who trust in God. The psalm begins with, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. God tells us over and over throughout the scriptures that even though we don't deserve it, we are forgiven and loved unconditionally. There is hope for each one of us, even the wayward ones. How many of you here are parents? And how many of you parents have perfect children? Huh. Oh, we got one. <laughs> oh, we got two. All right. <laughs> I don't think I've found one in my family yet. <laughs> I am blessed with two children, a son and a daughter. Both went through difficult phases in their youth. And in fact, both had run-ins with the law. I'm not the first parent to have a child get into trouble. And in spite of everything, I've never stopped loving my kids. And nothing gives me more satisfaction than having the whole family around the table, serving them their favorite foods on special days. Today, we read the very familiar parable known as the prodigal son. There are three main characters in this story, and each has a different perspective. Jesus tells us that the younger son had asked for his inheritance so he could go out and see the world. His father had obliged, perhaps because he could see the wanderlust in his son's eyes and knew that he would only learn by making his own mistakes. Sure enough, the young man squandered the money on parties and women until it was gone. And when a famine came, he had nothing set aside to sustain himself. The story goes that he realized then that the only place he could go was home. And he was in hungry enough to face whatever consequences might befall him, even if it meant becoming a servant for a warm bed and some food in his belly. We may be skeptical and believe that he was greedy and manipulative, but if we take the story at face value, the young man was contrite and prepared to make amends. The next character we meet is the father, a father who loved both his sons and probably missed his younger son dearly. No phone calls text messages or emails, all the father could do is look down the lane every day, wondering whether his son was still alive and longing to hug him once more. He could have been angry and disowned the, his younger son. He could have ban banished him to sleep with the animals. But instead, when he saw his son Coming down the lane, he ran out to embrace him and welcome him home. What a sense of joy and relief he must have felt. He told his servants to bring the fine clothes, sandals, and a ring for his finger, and to fill, kill the fattened calf and prepare a celebratory feast. The father's love was unconditional, and the rest was water under the bridge. A wise teacher once told me, always look for God in Jesus' parables. Surely the benevolent father represents God, for he responds to his son's return 
with grace and mercy. But then we have the matter of the older son. He is not at all happy with the turn of events. He resents his brother and his foolish ways and is jealous of his father's extravagant welcome. When his father urges him to come in and join the party, he rebukes him with righteous indignation. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your money on partying, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. We can probably relate to the older son too. Sometimes people who are dutiful and responsible get overlooked for someone more charming. It doesn't seem fair. But remember, Jesus was talking to a mixed crowd that included the Pharisees, who were followers of religious laws and had pretensions of righteous superiority. They didn't like the fact that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and other ne'er-do-wells. Perhaps Jesus was telling them, hey, you don't have a monopoly on God's favor. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Certainly the sons in this story reflect our human foibles. The desire to rebel, the shame of realizing that you really messed up. Or the one who has always done the right thing, but cannot forgive his brother's reckless behavior. But home, for all three of them, is a refuge a safe place of unconditional love. So it is with God, even when we are prodigal, wasting the gifts we've been given. The magnitude of God's capacity to love and forgive is on a whole different realm than what we can offer or even conceive of. God is just waiting to welcome us home. Home for the prodigal son is a welcoming feast. How often in the Bible do we see the image of a table spread before us? God serves up a veritable buffet of spiritual nourishment, soul food, if you will. If we are hungry for acceptance, forgiveness, and unconditional love, God provides an all-you-can-eat buffet. We are called to feast on a grace-filled relationship with God. Jesus demonstrated God's grace by breaking bread with the last, the least, and the lost of society, including tax collectors, prostitutes, and the poor. His message to them was that they mattered too. They were offered living water and dignity. We often judge those people who do not save, plan, or live within their means. We think of it as a weakness, and if people like that become unable to feed themselves, some will claim that they are unworthy of support, that they had it coming when they hit hard times. But Jesus tells us this parable to remind us that that is not how God's kingdom works. We are not judged for what we've done or failed to do. We are loved, cared for, and met in our place of need without being identified as deserving or not. If you're hungry, you're deserving of food. 
no questions asked. If you're without shelter, you deserve to be safely and properly housed. God's welcome intends to leave no one on the outside looking in. When I think of God's gracious welcome, I picture a banquet table in a field on a warm spring day, laden with fresh food from around the world, inviting us all to partake. The table stretches on as far as I can see, and there is a chair for everyone who wants to share in the goodness of God. I envision the landowners and the migrant workers who come to pick the fruit, the politicians and the personal support workers, the priests and the survivors of residential schools, Jews and Muslims, Hindus and Christians, protesters and police officers, Ukrainians and Russians. All generations, religions, and cultures coming together to break bread. There is love and laughter and the breaking down of barriers. And when everyone has been served, we all join hands and say grace. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. We are loved, we are forgiven, and we are nourished in body and soul. God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pause for a few moments of silent contemplation followed by prayer. Thank you, God, for arms opened wide to receive us, love given freely to reshape us, and forgiveness generously shared to redeem us. Amen. Our next hymn is from More Voices, number 178, Who is My Mother? Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred 
head and spirit through Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. We respond in faith to the many blessings God has given us with our offerings of time, talent, and tithe. And I believe there's an offering basket at the back. Yes. So let us pray. As the prodigal son made for home, we turn back to you. As the parent celebrated his return, we rejoice with all who love you. We are not worthy to receive all that we have. And what we offer is a simple token of all that you have given. So receive us and our offerings as we come with grateful hearts into the love of God, creator, redeemer, and spirit. Amen. As we prepare for the uh, prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer, I, I, are there any joys or concerns you would like to raise up today? Okay. okay. This is a responsive prayer. So when I say, God in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you today with grateful hearts for your abundant gifts of grace and mercy. We thank you for your open invitation to come to the table and for the soul food you provide us. We thank you for the promise of spring, the waning of the pandemic, hopefully, and the opportunity to connect with family and friends once again. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, we pray today for the people of Ukraine, those who are fleeing for safety and those who stayed behind, either to fight for their country or because they were too frail to travel. We pray for all people of color who have been living in Ukraine, that they also may find a safe way home. And we pray for unity among all countries who are committed to a resolution of this conflict. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that reconciliation will overcome hatred Peace will conquer war, hope will replace despair, and that your plans for the world and for its people will be fulfilled. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforting God, be with all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up those who are grieving, lonely or anxious. Help them to know that they are not alone. Your love is always with them. Be with our First Nations communities, especially those who do not have clean water, lack adequate housing, and are still reeling from the discoveries of children buried at residential schools. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our global partners, Iglesia Bautista Emmanuel in El Salvador, and the Jipembe Congregation of the United Church of Zambia. And Holy One, be with those for whom we each have a special concern in the silence of our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, we pray for your strength and wisdom 
to help us through these challenging times. Help us to build a bigger table, to be kind and compassionate with one another, even those who have gone astray. May we find ways to share the good news of your love and hope in a hurting world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I would invite you to stand for our closing hymn and remain standing for the commissioning and benediction. Our hymn is Voices United 271, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. There's a wideness in God's mercy Like the wideness of the sea There's a kindness in God's justice Which is more than liberty There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in hell. There is no place where earth's failings have such gracious judgment given. There is plentiful redemption in the blood that Christ has shed. There is joy for all the members in the sorrows of the head. Troubled souls, why will you scatter like a crowd of frightened sheep? Foolish hearts, why will you Please join me in the response of commissioning and benediction. Let's go into the world as people of gratitude. Let's go into the world as people of hope. Let's go into the world as people of joyfulness. Oh. <laughs> And let us go knowing this, we are never, ever alone. The peace of Christ holds us, the love of the Creator enfolds us, and the wings of the Holy Spirit carry us, today and always. Amen.